Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. Well, we have a special treat tonight. Um, we recorded this a couple of days ago, so we're, we're not also <laughs> with our interview guest right this moment. We're recording the intro later, but um, but we had a nice discussion with Mike Termott, um, and uh, well, I guess we'll just get right on into it. Sounds like a plan. All right, here we go. All right. This is the Liberty Mike podcast, and we're on with Mike Termott. He is one of the Libertarian Party's potential nominees for president in 2024, and he has graciously agreed to join us tonight for this interview. And we hope that we can help you get to know him a little better and better understand what the party stands for. So, Mike, would you like to give us a little introduction and tell us about your background? Uh, sure. Thank you. I appreciate uh, you making the time and the availability for me to join you tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to, to answer your questions and, and speak with your audience. I am with the Libertarian Party. A lot of your folks uh, know about the Libertarian Party. Philosophically speaking, we're the descendants of the people who put together the, the Constitution that wrote the Declaration of Independence that formed our American government and did so for the singular, I would argue, singular legitimate purpose of protecting our individual liberty. As far as uh, myself is concerned, uh, I'm a professional economist. I spent uh, you know, the better part of three decades in the banking industry in Washington, D.C. I worked for the White House for a, a couple of years. I worked for a couple of other international agencies. Uh, I was in the uh, financial services business as a market for greater competition and free markets in, in Washington. I had my own business for several years uh, in the in in the industry of educating bankers and other financial services professionals and providing strategic consulting services. As a, as a second career in public policy and, and public service, I went to work as a police officer in 2010. I was on the road for 11 years in Broward County, Florida. I spent uh, 20 years in Florida altogether. I'm back in Virginia right now, uh, but uh, I did spend 11 years on the road in Broward. It was a it was a great experience. Uh, all of that time was as a registered libertarian. So as you might imagine, you get into some pretty interesting conversations with your with your peer group, uh, and and you you develop from some pretty strong opinions about what we need to do to reform our criminal justice system and the way that we manage police officers. So in that sense, I've I've been around a little bit. The campaign that we're putting together for the for the Libertarian Party presidential nomination is quite a bit different from other campaigns past and present. Number one, we're running on a on a fairly bold platform of some of the most transformational ideas in libertarian thought. We call that platform the Gold New Deal. We are poking fun a little bit, obviously, at the original New Deal of FDR and and the concepts under the Green New Deal of AOC. We believe that we need a brand new relationship, a fundamentally different relationship between us and, and our government, especially our federal government, but also a different relationship between us and states, and certainly absolutely a different relationship between state governments and, and the federal government. So that's why we call it the Gold New Deal, gold being the, the branding color of the Libertarian Party. So that's one thing that makes our campaign stand out a little bit. And the other one is that we're running a very, very professional campaign. We have 14 people on, on board that we're paying uh, a little bit. And of course, we're running on a, a very, not only policy forward, very professional uh, platform, but we're running with a great deal of credibility. We back up all of our proposals with a, a great deal of detail. And that comes from my personal background in, in public service and public policy. So that gives you a little bit of uh, flavor for, for what's going on. Okay. I think I'd like to start with the law enforcement issues. Certainly the Justice Department is getting a lot of criticism at this time for being a political organization. At a more basic level, though, what are your concepts of reforming law enforcement in this country, and how would you do that as president? The, the basic idea 
is that you want law enforcement to work much more like other industries, which is to say subject to market forces with greater competition. You want law enforcement officers uh, to see more competition for their services, as well as more competition for the agencies themselves at a local level. So for example, you would want the results ultimately to include that the best officers get paid more uh, poor officers get paid less and crappy officers get fired just like any other uh, any any other business we believe that market force is being brought to bear at a at a at a higher level among competitively arranged agencies competing to provide the services would also contribute a great deal to holding officers accountable, holding agencies accountable, officers in particular with greater transparency regarding discipline and greater flexibility so that communities would be in a better position to make sure that their values were being represented in how law enforcement agencies were, were managed. We think that that's uh, very important. One piece of that is to sunset the federal doctrine of qualified immunity and to replace that with a requirement that officers carry liability insurance more like physicians do in terms of malpractice. We don't believe that a situation in which someone feels that they've been wronged uh, but, but cannot seek redress in court is is fundamentally un-American. That is not the way you want the system to work. That's not the way the system works with regard to malpractice, for example. We don't tell people, well, the doctor didn't, you know, mean to cut off the wrong toe. So, you know, suck it up, buttercup. That's not the way that uh, the system works in other industries. And I don't believe it's the way the system should work in law enforcement. At I'm the, glad you brought that up, actually. I was going to ask you specifically <clears throat> if you plan to challenge courts on some of those judicial doctrines like qualified immunity, asset forfeiture, et cetera. Uh, how would you plan to do that as president? And do you have a plan in mind to challenge those judicial doctrines? Yeah, at the at the federal level, you can certainly move legislation. You you could try to challenge it, but it's been it's it's withstood challenges up until now. Uh, so I would not be optimistic that that would go well. I would uh, move federal legislation uh, to uh, to remove uh, and to obviate uh, the federal doctrine of qualified immunity. I believe that states would then have to pick it up and require officers to carry liability insurance. Communities uh, could on their own, agencies could on their own, all the way down to the most granular level. And market forces are gonna push officers in the direction of carrying liability insurance. But what you ultimately want is for the officers, the individual officers to be responsible uh, for the premium rates. And so that's gonna be a fairly, uh, you know, detailed, fairly granular uh, result that you're looking for. So in that sense, uh, a, a libertarian administration would have to lead a, a national conversation on it more than being able to impose, you know, your your will on the situation. Qualified right, immunity. Presumably, sort of presumably, you're not going to have a Congress that's on your side with both Republicans and Democrats supporting police forces and their qualified immunity. I don't believe the legislators would be on your side. Uh, not at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm, I might be a little bit more optimistic uh, than you are in the sense that it, it can get wrapped into a package that, you know, does certain things for police officers. As far as, uh, you know, the others, asset forfeiture is a, a state level problem. Um, uh, I certainly think that legislatures can be scooched in the right direction. There are some already moving in the right direction. And so I'd be more optimistic about that. I think that most Americans don't realize uh, how it works. I think most Americans don't care about a lot of these issues because they figure they're never going to be on the wrong side of the law, right? Which is one of the reasons why law and order is typically such a winning issue for politicians, particularly at the local uh, level, because people just imagine, you know, it, the the downsides of a heavy hand are, are not going to affect me. 
and that my community will be safer with with a heavier uh, foot of law enforcement. And uh, whereas that's not typically true, uh, most Americans don't get involved in in law enforcement at a very uh, detailed level, especially uh, politically. So I think that there's some work to do that would that would uh, that would pay off, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, sticking with law enforcement, but changing topic, how would you deal with the immigration crisis? Uh, immigration is a real problem. Um, a, an element of it is law enforcement. Um, I, it's it's not so much uh, uh, a law enforcement uh, practice idea, but a policy uh, problem, in my view. I was down there at the Arizona-Mexico border in, uh, I guess it was January for a couple of days. I met with local law enforcement and met with uh, Customs Border Patrol, uh, met with local uh, libertarian leaders, met with ranchers who have property on the border. And what I came away understanding is that it's a fairly, in my view, underreported, underappreciated humanitarian crisis the the numbers of people coming across the border are frequently reported we understand that they're in the hundreds of thousands and millions in the course of a year what i what i think that most americans don't appreciate is the extent to which uh, a black market in human trafficking has been created that funnels uh actually most people that come across the border without papers into either some form of indentured servitude or uh, or worse. Um, I won't go into great detail, but uh, it's, it's a, a fairly horrific situation for quite literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people each year. And I think it's a real black mark on our society, uh, legally, ethically, uh, in a humanitarian sense, I think it reflects badly on us in a foreign policy sense, in an image sense, but just the, the fundamental ethics of it, uh, I find horrifically problematic. What I would do uh, first is to surge resources to the border to, to do two things. One is to pick up the pace with which we vet people into this country. The idea that it should take weeks, I think, is... Uh, somewhere between silly and stupid. The presumption should, in, in, unless, in, unless an individual shows up on some database as being problematic, the presumption should be to clear individuals in. When I worked for the White House, we could clear somebody in in 90 minutes. So the idea that oh, you know it should take weeks at the border is just, I realize it's slightly apples to oranges, but you get my point. The idea that it should take weeks at the border is, uh, is is absolutely uh, unconscionable and unsustainable at a technical level. So it, it's really just a matter of committing the the resources uh, to get people through. Uh, the other thing that I would do is commit resources to closing the border uh, in a more robust fashion, not to cut down on the volume of immigration. Indeed, I believe that we need more immigration. Immigration is good for the United States for a, a number of reasons that we can go into. But I would surge resources to the border to shut down illegal immigration with the idea of shutting down the black market and human trafficking, which is so dangerous, and funneling people through legal means and making sure that we can get people through uh, not just faster, but 10 times faster. You know, the, the volume of individuals that we need to be able to get through legally needs to step up by, by an order of magnitude. We need to change that pretty fundamentally. And other changes I would make would include, for example, telling people to go to work right away. I, I find the idea that we tell people that they shouldn't work for some period of time uh, that you have to earn your way to a green card. I think that that's bass backwards. I think that that's counter both to, you know, where we are as a society, as a people, as a matter of ethics, also as a matter of economics. Um, I would much prefer a policy that says, I'm going to call you in two weeks and make sure you have found a job, right? 
Uh, I would even be open to the idea of public resources helping people find jobs. But uh, certainly we need to be out of the business of telling people that they they can't work. So uh, immigration is fundamentally good for America. And I think that we need more of it, but we need to do it in a way that uh, cuts down on, on the humanitarian crisis we have at the border right now. That's something we talk about on this podcast a lot is the idea of like a sponsorship program where like you have a plan before you just show up in this country. Um, where would you stand on that? Uh, I would, I, I'm a big believer in sponsorship programs. Uh, and I think we should do everything we can to encourage them to foster them. Uh, I don't think I would require them because then you're right back in the soup uh, to enforce it. First of all, to enforce it would mean cutting down immigration by an order of magnitude. You're just not going to get uh, anywhere near the number of sponsorship programs that you would need. And and so just as a practical matter, I think that you wind up with uh, an enforcement problem. Uh, but I do believe that we should do everything we can to foster sponsorship programs uh, in, in, I think it should be at a private sector institutional level it, rather than a family to family level, because I think that's the kind of volume that that we're talking about that would be needed. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Moving on from immigration to an issue that is probably still important to people. What would you have done? This is a multi-part question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> what would you have done as president of the United States to protect the American people during the covid pandemic? Would you have allowed the U.S. states to impose lockdowns, mask, or vaccine mandates? What about the va vaccine passport issue? And uh, what constitutional powers would you have invoked to either prevent or support these measures? Uh, I would have uh, sued the states against doing any of those things. Um, I, I am surprised that the American public and governmental institutions rolled over quite as easily as they did with regard to masks, with regard to uh, mandates, uh, certainly. The idea that a government should be able to tell you that you have to take a vaccine or lose your job uh, is not just constitutionally problematic, and, and it is, but it's, uh, it, it, it should be horrifying to Americans. And I believe that in the in the fullness of time, people will eventually look back on on what happened and view it with incredulity. I, I think that you will have to explain it to people. And I am hopeful that eventually people will say, no, that you're exaggerating, right? That didn't actually happen. Um, but it did happen. Uh, I, I think that a lot of a lot of things went wrong. Uh, certainly, the federal government being so involved with the development of vaccines is a problem. Just right out of the box, you know. Let's let's peel back several years. I don't have a problem with public resources being involved in the dissemination of information. But we have so perverted the market for developing pharmaceuticals, including vaccines, that th there are at least two layers that have to be removed. Not only are we into this financially as a government, but we have government officials who see personal remuneration based on the development of vaccines. That is, that is not just a conflict of interest. That is that is messed up. That is just fundamentally messed up. So you got to peel all that away. But you've also got to peel away the federal statutes that say that the the developers of vaccines don't have to face liability when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate the argument that says, well, you know, vaccines are good. We want vaccines developed. Uh, we don't want to discourage them. It's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that we need for the firms that develop any medical product 
or any product for that matter, any business in any industry, we want them to internalize the costs and the benefits, the risks and the upside. And we need courts to play their role in making sure that the downside risks are real. They are internalized by those that uh, that rolled out the products so that they can, in a more effective manner, in a more economic fashion, take these into considerations and make better decisions. So we should not be protecting them from, from downside risks. So just in terms of how the, the market was developed, you know, that's a mess. But having said that, uh, it's okay with me for the government to uh, help disseminate information as a matter of principle. However, as a practical matter, our government screwed it up. And I believe the government screwed it up uh, for a couple different reasons. If, if, you, if you believe in the theory that, that most bad government decisions are made out of stupidity and not out of evil malice, you know, you can attribute a great deal of what the government did to just fundamentally not understanding uh, how vaccines work uh, and not understanding the data that were uh, available and, and getting hoodwinked to a certain extent by, by big pharmaceutical companies. All, all of that is true. On the other hand, it is also true that there were people in the federal government that had personal interests at stake and who I believe were either happily manipulated or happy to pass on the manipulation in, in ways that did not serve the public well in terms of disseminating uh, information. It would have been nice if the federal government had done a better job of allowing us to know everything that they knew, but I would argue at least as importantly to let us know everything that they didn't know. If they had been honest about, we don't have data on side effects. We're not gonna have data on side effects. We don't have data on transmissibility. We're not gonna have data on transmissibility. We don't have data on how well masks work and we're not gonna. If they had been candid about these things, I think that certain people would have been able to make better decisions. I think that people wouldn't have resented the decisions that they made when they later found out that the data did not support their decisions in the way that they had earlier believed that they had. And then, of course, uh, there, there was political division that was fostered by political officials not disclosing certain types of information and then jumping into information in a way that was manipulative. And that is ultimately something that I believe fueled the incentive for the federal government to start participating in such a robust fashion in the censorship of private sector communications in, in these areas. And we, we know that the government, we now know that the government was involved in censorship for uh, you know, years prior, I, I appreciate that, but in a much more robust fashion in the areas related to, to COVID uh, and related to the vaccines. I think that as a matter of policy, as a matter of attitude, we as a public need to get much better at holding our government accountable to the First Amendment. We We all, I think, grew up with the idea that we would not tolerate government intervention in our institutions of faith, right? We, you know, we're, we're very good as, as a nation, as a people, we're very good at understanding how important it is to separate uh, church and state. We need to get similarly good at holding this principle to account with regard to the separation of science and state. I, I do not believe the government has a legitimate role in science generally. I think the government makes profoundly bad decisions. I think that's partly the result of public education in this country. 
People believe that science is a collection of facts uh, rather than a process of eliminating possibilities and don't understand that science is moving all the time and actually science proceeds through disproof rather than proof. That's well said. I think that that's very well said. I also think that uh, government officials are good at manipulating individuals, people's uh, curiosity, people's fear. Mm -hmm. Um you know, if, fear is a powerful tool. If fear is a powerful, arguably the most powerful political tool. It's where authoritarianism comes from. And I think that there is a, a big element of that going on. You know, you look at the Republican and the Democratic parties, you have to you have to recognize that each one is left behind their what what used to be their policy agenda. Each one has adopted as their primary objective, keeping the other one out of power. And so you know, we have learned, well, initially by looking at growing authoritarianism in other democracies around the world when we thought it wouldn't happen in the United States, but it has. This idea of a politician telling you what you really have to fear is not the loss of your civil liberties, but it's that other schmuck coming to power. That's what you really have to worry about. And I can protect you from that if you if you give me a greater authority. That's where a lot of this comes from. And so the divisiveness that we saw during COVID absolutely lent itself to that. And I think it was a big contributing factor behind the government uh, overreach, especially in terms of lockdowns, especially in terms of, uh, of mandates. So I, I find that whole bailiwick uh, problematic, but I also find it problematic. Uh, and I speak as someone who was trained as an aeronautical engineer a hundred thousand years ago. Uh, I'm not a fan of NASA. Um, I just don't think it has a legitimate role in our society. I think it's a waste of resources. For example, I think it's a waste of resources for the government to go chasing this idea of, uh, you know, the extent to which we've been visited by aliens. I think to the extent to which they have, government officials have, information, they should disclose that. But I think that spending resources trying to make first contact or something silly like this is a is a waste of money i mean it just seems that to me that going in front of congress and talking about aliens and whatnot is just yeah. a distraction i agree with you i think it's a distraction from more important things i think it's a distraction from things that they don't want to talk about and i think it's a way to to grab the curiosity of of their constituents in a way that makes them look a lot more interesting than they otherwise would uh, we only have about 10 minutes. We can restart after a short break if you'd like to go on. Sure, go ahead. But I want to address the foreign policy issues since that's really the primary role of the president of the United States to be the figurehead in foreign relations. Yes. So if you were to become president today, where do you believe U.S. troops should be deployed, if anywhere? In the United States. That's it? Just defending our borders? and, and that, is, that, that is the, uh, the extent of the list. Um, okay. it, it, getting there from where we are now is, is not, uh, easy, right? Um, the president does have a great deal of latitude. Uh, we have certain treaties abroad. We have certain obligations that we need to unwind. Uh, and we have, uh, certain, uh, theaters in which we want to, uh, you know, extricate ourselves at a certain pace. Uh, so I, I am not sophomoric enough to suggest that this would be, you know, accomplished uh, by February after a January inauguration. But day one, you can absolutely, for example, day one, you can make calls to the heads of state of the European powers and say, you know, this is your 18 month heads up. If you choose to remain paranoid of the Russian army, notwithstanding what we have learned the past year, that the Russian uh, military was unable to overrun Ukraine, uh, if nonetheless, if you and your population and your advisors believe that you need to remain as fearful as you have been, then it's time for you to start spending 2% of your GDP, two and a half, three, three and a half, whatever you think the right number is, uh, because the United States is no longer going to be your plan A. Uh, I don't even like the idea of us being your plan B. 
but uh, to the extent to which we decide as a nation, as a government, that we need to be involved in some military conflict, we will cross that bridge when we come to it. We should not be obliged to an Article 5 type of treaty arrangement uh, a la NATO. Uh, I might argue that it has not been in our interest to be in NATO for you know since uh a few weeks after we signed that but certainly it is not in our interest today we cannot justify telling the american people that we are going to continue to take money from you forcibly and use it to spread to project military power in europe uh for the sake for the sake of control or for the sake of defending uh, european nations that uh, can jolly well uh, take care of themselves. The other big thing that I think needs to be changed on day one is we need to send the signal that the days of strategic ambiguity are over. There is there is no such thing as a relationship that is made better, stronger, smarter, more durable uh, by some sense of ambiguity, and certainly not in foreign relations. We have created, in in some sense. In the, in the minds of a lot of government officials in the American government, we have created a, a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy by either accidentally or intentionally signaling to investors that if, if you were to build plants in Taiwan, if you invest in the development of technology in Taiwan, uh, you know, we're going to be there to back you up. We're going to make sure that you're safe. And... Uh, we should not have been sending that signal. Now we're in this situation where we believe that a lot of the investment in Taiwan is critical uh, to our supply chains, mostly technology, mostly namely, you know, silicon chips and and mostly namely, to a large extent anyway, uh, high-end chips, which are about to become even more valuable in the age of uh, artificial intelligence. But if the signal has to be sent right away that if you are considering new investment in Taiwan because you believe that that is a place where the American government is going to make sure that uh, nothing ever changes, then, you know, can I can I interest you in Milwaukee, right? Um, you know, there are places that the United States government is obliged to make sure is uh, safe, uh, but it does not make sense in the, in the long run uh, to include on that list uh, Taiwan. And uh, I, I believe that we need to send that signal right away and begin the process of unwinding the projection of, of power at bases around the world. There's a great deal of money to be saved, but there's also a great deal of war to be avoided. I believe that part of the reason we keep getting into conflicts is because we can. And because we can, others allow it. Uh, people look to us as the only power that can. Someone needs to do it, is often said. No one else is able to. It's often said. Uh, we need to learn to corral our resources so that we don't end up in these weird ethical conundra where People look to us because, you know, we're the only solution in town. Uh, it's just not ethically appropriate and it's not economically feasible to sustain in a long run sense. OK, how then would you deal with the threat of China or Russia or Iran or North Korea or fill in the blank? What do you think is the answer to at least what's widely regarded as threats from these nations? Well, I'm glad you said widely regarded. I, I believe that we need to we need to lead a national conversation in terms of what we mean by the word threat. Uh, there are certain threats uh, that has to be unpacked. There are, you know, people consider commercial competition to be a threat. Uh, that's silly talk. And we need to lead a debate through that so that people understand that we are not under threat uh, by the development of foreign economies. It's actually uh, in our interest, in our favor, for foreign economies uh, to develop in a more robust fashion. 
that does not mean that we should put up with what we would consider to be criminal activity sponsored by, uh, you know, the People's Republic of China, uh, outright theft of intellectual property, outright intimidation of people on American soil, hacking into American corporations. These are criminal activities that we need to hold them to account for. No question about it. That's a different category than just, you know, an economy getting bigger and stronger. So we need to deal with that. In a, in a military sense, which is where the word threat really starts to, to carry more water, you've got to tease out the difference between nuclear threats and conventional threats. The idea that China, for example, is able to overrun Taiwan or able to threaten Taiwan, that is not the same thing is able to threaten the United States. And we need to begin what I predict is, is necessarily going to be a long conversation. It, it has been a long conversation to get to this point where most Americans believe that we need to defend places abroad in our own interest. It is not true, but it will take a long conversation to, uh, to unwind that. A piece of that, of course, is unwinding that in terms of military posture and allowing the American people to see we're still safe and sound, right? Just the, the demonstration effect alone uh, is, worth, uh, is, is worth an army. Uh, Do you have another 10 or so minutes sure. for us and we take a quick break and finish this up proper? That'd be great. All right, and we're back. Uh, is there any support that you'd want to provide to Taiwan or Ukraine or any other nation that is under threat? Uh, at the governmental level, uh, no. I would certainly open up uh, private sector commercial transactions. I don't have a problem with that. But I don't uh, think that we can justify taking money from American citizens forcibly and using that uh, to project power abroad. It, it's clear now that the reason that the federal government of the United States is backing Ukraine is because it believes it to be in our interest to be in a proxy war with Russia. We know that- You don't agree? That, that it's in our interest to be in a proxy war with Russia? Yes. Uh, sort of no, tongue in cheek there. <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, at, at least that would be an argument, right? I mean, it, mm. I would have appreciated them saying that up front. We could have had a national debate on that, I think. Um, indeed, there are probably some people that that would have won over that were not won over by the idea of, of providing resources simply because Ukraine was such a terrific democracy. You know, that is demonstrably, objectively speaking, that's silly talk. And and I I, I just it, it feels uh, dishonest to the point of being slightly smarmy to try to sell us on this proxy war by claiming that Ukraine was a battlefront for democracy. Uh, you know, I, I still would have been against the idea, but it would have felt uh a little bit more strategically honest if they had said, look, um, you know, we believe that Russia is a threat in the long run. And if if we fund the Ukrainians, it's going to diminish their ability to wage war in the future. And for this reason, we think it's a, a good idea. Um, in fact, I, I think that you could probably make the argument that the Russians' inability to overrun Ukraine demonstrates that that would have been a bad idea, to, that, that even the argument that we should be in a proxy war with Russia because Russia is a, a long-term threat, you know, that argument has been undermined by witnessing what we have the past year. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, I don't think that there's uh, value to either one of those arguments. I feel... I feel badly uh, on behalf of the Ukrainians, obviously for the for the Russian invasion. Um, 
And I feel badly for the Ukrainians that in some sense, I think you could argue that they were uh, duped uh, a bit by things that were said by the American government, things that were said by the Russian government when they were convinced to to give up uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I think that there was, at the very least, an implicit uh, commitment to, to there not being uh, a war. I, I think that the United States has done the Ukrainians absolutely no favors whatsoever by allowing the Russians to believe that we would bring Ukraine into NATO eventually someday under the right conditions. And in that sense, I think that the Biden administration has really blown it completely recently by saying in the long run, that we absolutely expect uh, Ukraine uh, to come into NATO because now you've got a situation where if you're if you're Vladimir Putin, which is to say uh, neither a good guy nor a smart guy, I am no apologist for this for this uh, human. You know, that is one of the few governments uh, on the planet that makes ours look really smart. <laughs> but if you're if you're Vladimir Putin, you've got to say to yourself, well, hell, now now I can't back down. Right now, I've got to win this thing and I've got to win it completely. I'm not even sure I want to negotiate ever maybe because you you can't trust the americans um uh, and it looks to me like a whole heck of a lot of europe wants to bring nato to the border between russia and uh and ukraine and that's not something that i can tolerate politically it's not something that fits with my view of the great sweep of history and uh even more rational people than i am in the Russian military think that that's a threatening posture. And for the combination of these reasons, I think that you have handed Putin a really good argument to keep pressing uh, this war. So I think that mistakes have been made recently. I think mistakes have been made over the last couple of years. And I think mistakes have been made over the last couple of decades. And none of them have helped the Ukrainian people. All right, Mike, I think that we each have one more question for you. Super. Thank you. Mine's real simple. If you believe in the idea that all presidents kind of get one thing in their term, um, what would you want your one thing to be that people remember your time as president as? Uh, the, the change in foreign policy that we've been discussing. Um, there are things that I think rival it in terms of importance. Uh, for example, I do believe that our crappy public school systems in the United States, uh, one could argue, uh, are a public policy problem of the highest magnitude. But that is a matter of, you know, an administration leading a national conversation. And in, in that sense, you can make a big contribution, but it is in no small part out of your direct control, as it should be as it should be out of your control. But I think that a president can have a, a tremendous amount of influence, particularly uh, a libertarian, and to be honest, particularly an economist who can point out how stupid it is to be going around granting monopolies. But uh, to your earlier point, that a president does have more responsibility and more uh, power, more latitude in terms of foreign relations, I think that more can be done there. and. And one of the reasons I think it's so important is, is because we can better align with American values. In other words, one of the problems, as I see it, there's two fundamental problems with American foreign policy being so militaristic in nature. One of them is that it represents a misalignment with who we are as a people. We are not an aggressive people by nature. We do believe in multiculturalism. We believe in tolerance. We do not believe in, in imposing our will on, on other people, which I think is why politicians have to go to such great lengths and have gone to such great lengths to convince Americans of these weird artificial reasons 
why it's in our interest to engage in these wars. Whereas, uh, I don't want to name names, but you could, be, you know, there are, there are plenty of other examples around the world where a leader can get some get some domestic traction by saying, we're going to engage in this because, uh, you know, the, the old empire covered that, that area. Or, um, you know, the people in, in, in that area are evil, they're bad. And, and those are arguments that are going to gain even less traction in the United States with Americans than, than they, they do elsewhere by the, by the nature of our values and ethics. And I, I believe in part because we are a nation of, of immigrants as well. And I do believe that Americans largely have a libertarian streak. I don't think that they would characterize it as such. Most Americans don't know what the heck libertarianism is. But I think that they have a libertarian streak. The other uh, aspect, the other reason that I think that our foreign policy is, is so problematic is not just that it misaligns with our values, but that we're just not good at it, simplistically said. Um, you know, on a tactical level, we seem to be very good at killing people and blowing things up. We're good at moving material. We're good at taking ground and holding it. We're good at opening sea lanes and protecting them. We're even good at toppling foreign leaders, if you don't mind the secrets eventually coming out, right? But in terms of are we good at achieving things that most Americans would say are in our long-term interests? I think you'd have to say uh, no, we're not. And most Americans would no longer argue that we are. There are not examples that Americans would point to and say, notwithstanding the billions of dollars that we spent and the thousands of lives that we lost, that was a good idea. You know, you can't point to Iraq or Afghanistan where it wasn't just billions, it was trillions. It wasn't just thousands of lives lost. It was hundreds of thousands of lives lost to include foreign nationals, as we should as a matter of an ethical proposition, you, you, you cannot point to those examples with a tremendous feeling of embarrassment, both ethically and objectively, practically, strategically. We have diminished our role in the world, the way that people view us. And, and the last piece I think that needs to be said as an economist is that not only are we wasting a tremendous amount of resources, but we are also diminishing our ability to lead the world toward a greater future commercially uh, in terms of economic development, in terms of trade. I'm a big believer in free trade and, and we need to foster trade in a way that says this aligns with our interests uh, and this aligns with our, with our values. And I think that an American president could make a, a great deal of uh, ground in, in that area. And I've heard you speak a few times in these debates with other libertarian potential nominees about how you'd bring the party together. But I've got a bigger question for you, which is, if you get the libertarian party nomination, how would you bring the U.S. voters as a whole behind you? Uh, that is a tremendous challenge. I think that a libertarian can do it, only can do it. Uh, in other words, there's an argument to be made that a Republican can't and a Democrat can't, a Democrat can't, but there's also an argument to be made that a libertarian could. And I think that you've it, it's a two-pronged uh, discussion. One is in terms of your personal interests, and one is in your in terms of your personal ethics. In other words, we have got to be the party that says, you know, if you're a Democrat, you know your party has left you. And similar, similarly, be able to say the same thing, same thing to Repo Republicans for a different set of, of issues, but to be able to say the same thing. If you're a Democrat and you believe in social tolerance, if you believe in everyone living their lives by their own standards, if you believe 
that you should be able to speak your mind, that the government has no business telling you what you can or cannot say. You are no longer accurately represented by the Democratic Party. And, and you know this, the Democratic Party is no longer socially liberal. If you have these values, you are already a libertarian. Let me, let me introduce you to the party that actually represents uh, your, your values. The Democratic Party uh, operates in a way that we don't. You know, we, we don't go around canceling each other and beating each other into believing the same things that, that, that we do. We are the party that was first out there protecting, uh, arguing for your right to marriage in any context, for example. We are the party that's going to stand up against censorship. We're the party that's going to stand up for your right to make whatever decision medically, whatever decision scientifically you want to make. We are the only party that represents a, a counter to militaristic intervention and pushing the idea of aggression around the world. If, if you are an anti-war Democrat, you are no longer represented by your party. And I think the same thing has to be said to, uh, to Republicans on those issues and others. If you are fiscally conservative, you're a libertarian. You are not a Republican. You, you have not been represented by a fiscally conservative administration or a fiscally conservative set of Republican politicians for a generation. I might argue for two generations. You should be frustrated if you believe that, you know, you, you join the Republican Party because you believe that there would be some rationality to the government uh, making expenditure decisions or some rationality in terms of who is going to be running the Federal Reserve System. If you believe that the Fed has been exercising discretion in a way that frustrates you because of the amount of inflation that we've had, then you should be a libertarian. You should be with a party that wants to hold the Fed accountable. Indeed, I want to change the Fed so fundamentally that it can be removed lock, stock, and barrel. I, I believe that we need to change the way that we conduct monetary policy fundamentally, that the change has to be made at an institutional level. And if you're frustrated by the way your Justice Department has behaved, the way the FBI has behaved, you could be a Republican or a Democrat, but each of your parties has left you. You should be a libertarian. You should be aligned with a party that wants to stand up for your right to be left alone, that will stand up for your right to be represented by a foreign policy that reflects your values, by fiscal policy, by monetary policy that reflects your values, so that you can live your life as you see fit according to your own standards, but also to be able to raise your family uh, in an environment of economic growth, economic development, of increasing incomes without the government making decisions to undermine you and undermine your family. All right. Thank you very much for being generous with your time here. Uh, if people want to know more about you and your campaign, where would you like to send them? Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. You've been very generous with, uh, with your time as well. Uh, you can go to either of uh, two websites. You can go to MikeTremont.com, which is the the basic uh, website for the campaign, but you'd have to spell it right. There's two A's in Termat, right? So you'd have to get the M-I-K-E-T-E-R-M-A-T.com. Easier might be to Gold New Deal, uh, go to goldnewdeal.org. Uh, goldnewdeal.org is the uh, URL for the platform. You can see the platform that I'm running on, but it links back and forth to MikeDermott.com so you can see other things about uh, the campaign. If you have an interest in working with the campaign, reaching out to the campaign, talking to uh, any of us, we have a, a big group of people. If you want to reach out to me personally, my personal contact information is on there. Uh, it's my real phone number. If you want to drop me a text, uh, give me a chance to call you back. You can call me straight away, but if I don't recognize the phone number, that might not work out so well. But my real uh, email address is on there too. And if you have questions or comments, if I've said something that drives you crazy, uh, feel free to reach out to me so we can discuss it. And if you, if you love everything you hear and you want to play a role, you can join as a volunteer, you can make a contribution. But I would encourage everyone who can 
who can hear what we're talking about today to get involved one way or another. Excellent. Again, thank you very much, and we really appreciate your time. Uh, we will spread this around, and I hope you get some contacts from our people. Well, I appreciate that. Send me a uh, link uh, where you have it posted, and I will spread it too. Absolutely. Will do. Thank you. You guys take care. Okay. I really enjoyed that. No, I, I super enjoyed it. I thought it was, it was great to hear from him, mm -hmm. um, kind of get an idea of where he stands. I'll be honest with you. I don't know a lot about any of the candidates right now in the LP. Um, so when he reached out to us, I Googled him and liked what I saw, what I saw, but I also kind of looked to see who else is officially in the race. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of folks, at least not a lot that I like care a lot about. So yeah. I like this guy. Um, I, I don't know much. I, I've watched some of the debates uh, that they've had um, with the, the few libertarian candidates that have enough of, I guess, of a following. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, he's performed the best in the debates. I don't yeah. agree with everything that he has to say, of course, because we're libertarians. Well, we're, but, we're libertarians. <laughs> uh, but I, I think he's really solid. I think he does a really good job of ex explaining his position. Yeah. yeah. And uh, letting people know where he stands. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that he... He seems like, ever since Gary Johnson, this has become an issue, of course, is that he seems like somebody that can handle an antagonistic press, Yeah, which is an important for a, a third-party candidate, especially in a year where we're, uh, once again, going to have two terrible major-party candidates that nobody really likes. Exactly. So, um, yeah, but uh, it was a fun interview. I'm glad we got to do that, and maybe we'll get to talk to him again sometime a little closer to the uh, to yeah. election time, if things go right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, cause we didn't really get to talk to him at all about economics and especially with his background in economics, I'd, I would like to have been able to spend some time on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, as it is, um, we expect to be back here next week. And, uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, like, and share, comment, subscribe, tell your friends, all that other stuff, everything all the interaction helps us and we really appreciate it and uh, we really appreciate you listening so we'll be back next week when we finally get this right and in the meantime try to stay free life short live free ciao later